Welcome to The Honey Girl of Auschwitz, featuring Esther Bosch. As you can see, we have a beautiful turnout. Thank you all for coming out for this important event. In particular, I'm so delighted that there are so many young people here to carry on the message of tonight's event into the future. I'd like to ask you to turn your cell phone to silent. My name is Rabbi David Bush, and together with my wife, Devorah, we run the Chabad Jewish Center in Petaluma, catering to the Jewish community as well as to the wider community to provide engaging and meaningful programs, celebrations, and special events for all ages. I would like to extend a special thank you to the Spreckles staff for helping put together tonight's event. Gail, Eddie, Nick, Harry, Rachel, and the whole team. Thank you. Thank you also to Mike and to Alexa for documenting tonight's event for posterity. We begin our program tonight with a beautiful melody, a song of faith, attributed to the Jews on cattle cars of a transport on the way to Auschwitz. Even in the darkest of times, they didn't give up their faith and hope in a better tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, please turn your attention to the screen. Dark clouds began to cover the skies of Europe, the clouds of Nazism. And as they invaded Warsaw, they moved Jews, men, women, and children into the ghettos. Slowly, over time, the ghettos began to empty. Even the birds stopped singing, as if they knew what came next. The trains of doom filled with the innocent and the pure, carrying them to their deaths. And it was on one such train headed to the death camp Treblinka, in the midst of the terror, the gasping, the weeping, and the despair, that a lone voice was heard singing. His name was Azriel David Fasting, the cantor of the saintly Moznitzer Rebbe, Rabbi Shaul Yedidja Elisa. People thought he had lost his mind, but Azriel's heavenly and sweet voice continued its soulful tune. There he was, face aglow, eyes closed in concentration as he sang the words of the Ani Ma'amin, I Believe Declaration. As if harmonizing with the angels, he sang devotedly of the nation's undying faith that the world would one day be a place of universal peace, tranquility, and human dignity. Gradually, the hundreds of listening ears joined his song, at first quietly, but slowly growing louder and louder. Soon the song spread from car to car, and every mouth that could still draw a breath joined in Azriel's haunting melody, Anima Amin. His eyes red from crying and his cheeks wet with tears. Cantor Fostig tore a piece off of his own shirt and jotted down the notes of his new composition. There he proclaimed, I will give half my share in the world to come to the person who will take my song to my saintly teacher, the Mosnitzer Rebbe, who had escaped to the shores of the United States. A hushed silence descended upon the train, and two young men appeared promising to bring the song to the Rebbe at any cost. Bidding farewell to their brothers and sisters, they jumped out of a hole they broke in the train's roof. One miraculously survived, and clutching dearly to the shirt, kept the melody alive. It was on Yom Kippur, just after the war, on the holiest day on the Jewish calendar, and the Mosnitzer Rebbe's synagogue in New York was filled with thousands upon thousands. As the Rebbe began singing the Anima Amin, the crowd wept bitterly. 
swaying back and forth as if in a different world. He trembled and declared, On their journey to the gas chambers, this song was born from the ashes of millions. And it is through this song that their voices shall continue to be heard, beckoning us to carry forth the torch of human decency until all of God's children are touched by its light. It's amazing to see so many people gathered here, not to watch our favorite sports team, not for the hottest new Broadway show, but to hear the first-hand account from an incredible woman, a survivor, a heroine. 
Tonight, we will hear about history. We will hear about the consequences of bigotry, hate, and anti-Semitism. But we will also hear about the strength of the human spirit and its ability to survive against all odds. We will hear about how during the dark days of the Holocaust, some tragically allowed their basest instincts to manifest. And at the same time, others chose to courageously rise to the occasion, expressing the divine spark within. Shortly after moving to Petaluma, we were driving in our car when my children excitedly noticed a mezuzah. A mezuzah is a scroll with a prayer written on it that is affixed to the doorpost of a Jewish home for blessing and security. I made a mental note that I would have to stop by and say hello. When I returned, I realized that what looked like a mezuzah from the street was nothing more than a discoloration of the doorpost. <laughs> However, believing that divine providence had brought me there for a reason, I knocked anyway. 93-year-old Greta answered the door. After hearing that I was a rabbi, Greta revealed that she came from Denmark, and during the war, a Jewish doctor came to them and asked her mother if they would take in his daughter. Despite the immense risk of being caught, they agreed and hid this Jewish girl named Sarah Kastensen. Days turned into months. Each night, under the cover of darkness, Greta and her mother would bring a portion of food down to the basement. Until one day, they came down and she was gone. Years later, and the war was over, there was a knock at their door. Sarah had came back to thank them and explain how on that night, the smugglers came to take her across the border to Sweden. If we, are if we are ever doubtful, yes, one individual's act of courage, bravery, kindness, and compassion can make all the difference. One good deed can change the world. In fact, it's the only way to do it. There is a Hasidic expression that says, you cannot fight darkness with a stick. The way to combat darkness is by turning on a light. The way to overcome evil is to overwhelm it with good. And so in today's world, it's not enough to hashtag stop hate. We need to start love. We need to live with compassion. We need to combat senseless and random acts of hatred with senseless and random acts of goodness and kindness. A woman who lives by these values and whose heart is larger than this auditorium is Esther Bosch. Esther just celebrated her 95th birthday two days ago. And while all those beautiful old cars at the American Graffiti cruising the boulevard cannot share their stories, Esther is here and able to share with us the echoes of the past and a vision for the future. We are so fortunate and grateful that Esther, along with her daughter Rachel, agreed to accept our invitation and travel from their home in Prescott, Arizona to share her incredible story and so that we can meet her in person. We wish her many more happy, healthy, and strong years in which she can shine her beautiful light into the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Esther Bosch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rachel. I often call myself chopped liver. <laughs> um, so I apologize for all the hardware, and I got tired of telling people that I'm a major klutz and that I fall easily, so I tell them my 95-year-old mother wasn't happy with something I said <laughs> and beat me. I want you to know why we're here. I'm going to introduce Mom in a minute, but I, I need for you to understand where we are coming from. Um, as the rabbi said, love is the only thing that can replace hate. 
Um, I believe that children are born as blank slates and that we write on them and we affect their future. And why instead of writing our prejudices, our dislikes and our hates, it would be so much brighter to write on them about love, about forgiveness. Um, it would make every difference in the world. So we speak, we speak, they can hear that, Ma, just saying. <laughs> we speak at schools, we speak at synagogues, at churches, at libraries, actually pretty much wherever we are invited. Mom's story needs to be told. Um, we have so many, we have thousands of letters at home written by high school students thanking us for what we're doing, telling us they really had no idea about this and promising that they will see to it that it never happens again. So that's the main reason we're speaking. The second reason is um, I was approached a couple of years ago about making a documentary or a book or something about mom's story. Mom tends to impact pretty much anyone she meets. So I was asked the first time and I said, mm, I don't think so. I did not want to see another film uh, portraying chimneys and skeletons and bodies. And I was asked the second time, I said no. But the third time I was asked, I thought to myself, you know, that is not mom's story. The chimneys and the skeletons are all true, but mom's story is teaching how to use the tools of love and forgiveness to lead a happy life and to create a new world. And so um, if you saw our business cards out there, our website is on it. If you care to contribute, we'd be ever so grateful. We're still in need. Uh, Mm, probably forty to forty thousand dollars to finish this film. And, uh, if anyone thinks they can help, it would be so appreciated. But without further ado, I would like to meet you to meet my mother. My mother, who I, I really thought that people woke up to spotless houses with baked cookies in the kitchen. I didn't realize that you had to get up at three, four o'clock in the morning to do this. But that was mom. Mom was also the one, you were four children, and we all got to eat whatever it was we wanted, no matter how much it entailed her to cook four different meals. Um, my mother's very special in a lot of ways. I don't tell her often, because I don't want her to have a big head, because she does live with me. <laughs> but she that's doesn't what, want I'm to not even going to say Esther, because all of Prescott calls her mom. You guys can call me mom, too. Shall I start with my child? Yes. OK, so <coughs> can everybody hear me? Yes. I was born in the Carpathian Mountains, in the same town, in the same house where my mom was born. It was Hungary. And then when I was born, it was Czechoslovakia. Then in 1938, the Hungarians came back. And then in 1942, the Nazis took over our town. And that was the end of the Jewish population. So just to explain, it all depended on which dictator was in power at the time. Even though it was the same little farmhouse, it kept changing. The name kept changing. It yes. was, tell them that It name. was in Hungarian, not Sulish. Then in Czechoslovakian, Velky Sevlush. And then the Russians took over. It became Vinograd. And now it's the Ukraine. And they also call it Vinograd. Anyways, the Nazis came in the second day of Passover in 1944. 
right next day, we had to wear a yellow star of David. And that was the, the, all the friends that I thought is our friends called us next day dirty Jews. I, as a 14-year-old, could not understand how I was clean yesterday, and today I'm dirty. It just couldn't enter my mind. And I went to school next day, and the teacher threw me out saying, you're a dirty Jew. You're not allowed to have a higher education. So I didn't even finish the eighth grade. And so it went on for two years. We were being tortured mercilessly. We went out on the street. We were beaten up. My father, who was a rabbi, and he had a long beard, and they were pulling on his beard until blood was coming out. So he had to go home and cut it off. He couldn't take the torture anymore, and that was very traumatic for a rabbi. And that went on for two years, being tortured mercilessly. And after two years, the Nazis decided to take us to the main synagogue, telling us to bring a suitcase and all the pillows and blankets we have. When we got into the synagogue, they tore off all the pillows and quilts. The synagogue became like a snowstorm. Sometimes I still have nightmares about that, the way the main synagogue looked. And from after that, they took us into a ghetto. They made like a four square street and put us into the ghetto. We were taken into the house right across from our house. We had to watch how our neighbors from the right took away all our belongings and our cow and geese and chickens. But the neighbor from the left risked his life calling out my father's name in the middle of the night so he can throw over a piece of bread. He knew we were starving. If he would have been caught, he would have been shot on the spot. So the reason I'm saying that there is some good people and not so good people. Mom, can we go back to your childhood? Yes. To what you did? Yeah. To the happy part? I had a wonderful childhood. My, my parents were very, very protective of me. I was climbing the Carpathian Mountains, climbing our trees, playing on the streets with my friends. I was very, very happy. It was wonderful until the Nazis came in. Who and lived I, with you? Who lived with you? And what did they do? Who did you live with? Your mother? Oh, with my grandmother and grandfather and my parents. We had no money to get a house, so we lived with my grandparents. My father was a rabbi. He made very, very little money. But he also uh, taught the boys the Torah, the Bible, and uh, the bar mitzvah lessons. So he made a little bit more money than the rest of the rabbis in town. But he had to go to collect his money every month 
from the boy's parents. He went into one house, he collected his money, he went into the next house, and he saw how poor they were, he left the money there. Most of the time he came home empty-handed. I can still hear my mom's voice saying, well, Morris, what are we going to do now? And Morris's answer was always the same. Don't worry, Fanny. God will provide. Sure enough, I don't ever remember going hungry. So I didn't have the fancy clothes my friends had, but I didn't need it. I didn't have it. I didn't even think of it. So this went, this was going on for six weeks in the ghetto, being tortured mercilessly, hardly any food or water. After six weeks, they decided to take us on a train. Actually, it was a cattle car. They pushed us in like 500 people in one cattle car. We had no room to sit down or anything, just standing up. If somebody died on the road, we had to hold them up because there was no room where to lay down. And we were traveling like this for a lot of days, maybe five, six days. And I was still holding my hands with my mom, and she was crying because it was coming my 16th birthday, and she was hiding a couple of eggs from the Nazis. Because we had chickens, but the Nazis took away the eggs, and he hid, she hid a couple of eggs a week so she could make me a birthday cake. So she was crying all the way on the train. Of course, it never happened. On my 16th birthday, May 28, 1944, is the night of the train at Auschwitz. Right away, my father, they took him, they threw him to the right. I was still holding my, my hands very strongly with my mom, and a Nazi came, tore our hands apart, threw my mom to the right, and took me into the barrack. And I was there for three and a half months, being tortured mercilessly. Sometimes we had to kneel on rocks until blood was coming out. And we were beaten, beaten mercilessly every day, every day. So if I may, Ma. So what she is talking about, kneeling in the, in the rocks, uh, they were counted twice a day. There were thousands of women, but they were lined up in rows of five. And every morning and every night they had to be counted. Now, a lot of people died, but they had to be accounted for. So they had to look to see if anyone had died on the electrified fence. They had to find those bodies. They had to find the bodies of anyone that didn't uh, come out of bed. But until that count was absolutely perfect, yeah. they, they could not leave the line They were tortured and beaten. So um, yeah. I wanted to explain about the, the yes. meticulousness of numbers. Yes, yes. Many times I was so tortured that I went to the barbed wire. And I couldn't touch it because in front of me came my parents' faces, and I couldn't touch it. But if they're alive and I'm not, I feel very strongly God put them in front of my face. And by the way, they were murdered 
on her 18th, on her 16th birthday, the day they got off yeah. the train. Yes. Anyways, we were standing in line, five women every day, twice a day, for hours and hours, whether it was rain or shine or thunder. Sometimes I'm still shaking when there is thunder. Although Rachel tells me, Ma, don't worry, God is laughing. But somehow I can't laugh. Yeah. Anyways, we were standing five women. I was standing in line with four sisters from my hometown. The youngest sister was my best friend. And we were standing five women in a row. And Dr. Mengele, I don't know if you heard of him, the angel of death, they called him, was coming on the lines every day. And whomever he felt like taking out, either to the gas chamber or for experiment, he took him away. One day he's standing in front of my line, and he had this horrible silver cane. And whomever he wanted to take out, he just pointed that cane. And he stays in front of my line, and it looked to me like he points his cane at me. So I step out of the line, and he takes this horrible silver cane pushes into my belly button, but so hard that sometimes when I have nightmares, I still feel that cane in my belly button and pushes me back to the line and takes out my best friend. What was her name? Her name was Rosico. And then they took her, he took her away and we go back into the barrack, that mean, mean couple points her, she says, is there anyone that have a family that was taken away? And the three remaining sisters says, yes, our little sister was taken away. And she says, with this mean voice pointing her fingers towards the gas chambers and saying, you see the chimney smoking? This is where your sister is. Up till today, I have girl feeling because I thought I was supposed to be there. And this torture went on for like three and a half months. In the meantime, I befriended a very good woman, two years older than I. We became like sisters. Her name was Helen. And one day the Nazis decided to take women to labor camps. So they put an incredibly heavy barrier towards the door because the barracks had no doors. So they put this incredibly heavy barrier in front of the door, left a little opening, and they looked at us, and whomever they felt could go to work, pushed them in, and whom not, pushed them away. Later finding out that we were taken straight to the gas chambers. So they pushed in my so-called sister, but they pushed me away. So I was standing there and crying. Now I even lost my so-called sister. As I was standing there and crying, this unbelievably incredibly heavy, heavy barrier fell over. The Nazis, of course, disappeared, and I snuck in. 
This is why I don't have a tattoo. I was not supposed to be here. But I feel very strongly God had other plans for me. And so I was, by the time I snuck into the barrack, my sister was taken away to another labor camp, and I was taken to a different labor camp. And so I was, it was called Fallersleben in the middle of Germany, somewhere. And I was there for nine and a half months. The food was a little better than Auschwitz. Not much better, but a little, a little more food. They well, wanted... It was scientifically chosen exactly how many calories a human being could survive on and exactly how many extra calories it would take yes. for them to be able to work. Yeah, yes. The Germans were very, very... Meticulous. Meticulous, yes. But we still had to stay in line to be counted, and we still had to stay in line for our food. And one day I'm staying, standing in line for my food, then a woman comes in front of me, and I see her bowl is already dirty. So I says, Ilonko, that was her name. I didn't have my food yet, and I see your bowl is already dirty. And she says, yes, but I'm still hungry. And we were arguing back and forth in Hungarian. Then a Nazi came. Of course, she did not understand what we were arguing about. But she decided to beat me up mercilessly, so badly that I could hardly crawl back into my bunk bed. I couldn't get up next morning to go to work. But we had a good couple in the labor camp. And when she saw I can't get up, she went for, to work for me for quite a few days, because if they wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been counted, they would have come look for me and take me back to Auschwitz, to the gas chambers. So she saved my life by going to work for me for quite a few days until I was able to get out of the bunk bed. And, and, to to the, and also to the count. Yes. Helen um, stood for mom's place with both the count and with labor, and that's how she saved her life. Yes. This is usually when I kind of like to remind people about being overly judgmental. <clears throat> Germany was, it, it, before World War I, was the height of art, of, of music, of art. They were highly, highly cultured. But after World War I, they had to sign a treaty of Versailles. And when they signed that treaty, they, they lost a lot of that culture and, and were felt to be defeated, defeated, a defeated people. So morale was very low. Poverty was very high. Nobody had anything. And um, so try to picture yourself. We all would like to believe that we are morally upstanding, that we would do the right thing, that in mom's situation, we would have been the neighbor that threw the bread over the fence, or we would have been, uh, what was her name, uh, the, the capo? Uh, Branya. Branya, that we would have been Branya and taken uh, the place of someone to assure that they lived. But try to picture for a minute, you are, um, the father in a family. You have a wife, you have a few kids, and you are dirt poor. You can barely feed them. And the Gestapo comes to you and says, look, if you tell us where the Jews are hiding, you can have everything they own. 
it's quite, it can be quite a moral dilemma. I would like to think that I would be on the right side of good, but until the situation occurs, I don't think any of us can know exactly how we would react. Yes, yes. So anyways, I was working in that factory for nine and a half months until the American soldiers were coming forward so they took us what they called a death march because many of us died on the road. No food, no water, just walking and walking. Then we finally wound up in another labor camp, which was called Salzweder. And this is where I found my so-called sister. And we were very, very happy. But the Nazis locked us in and disappeared. With no food, no water, we were there for two weeks until the American soldiers came, shut open the gate, and said, you are free. And go into town and take whatever you like. Of course, we didn't understand it. We huddled together because uniforms again, until they found us a Jewish soldier telling us in Jewish, go into town, take whatever you like. I didn't want anything. I thought I'm going home, find my parents, everything. But I picked up a big, big jar of honey. <laughs> It gets bigger with each telling. <laughs> By now I'm convinced she was pushing a barrel back to the <laughs> Anyways, I, I licked it up with my fingers. By the time I got back to the camp, I was deathly ill. And the soldiers took me into the infirmary and brought me back to health. I was in the infirmary like four weeks until I was able to get up and walk. But the soldiers called me the honey girl because I got sick from the honey. Years and years and years later, you want to tell the rest of the story? So anyway. Ah, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, anyway, um, almost exactly 16 years ago, my husband and I, my daughter, and my granddaughter, who was two, went to watch the fireworks on the 4th of July in uh, Chino Valley, Arizona. And... Uh, this two-year-old, Jasmine, is sitting in the stroller, and there are tears just running down her face. She was moved by the feeling of patriotism, the fireworks, the music. She wasn't hungry. She didn't need to be changed, but she was emotionally moved. She was empathetic to everything going on around her. So, of course, the next morning, I called Mom. I said, you would not believe Jasmine last night, and I tell her the whole story, and she says, did I ever tell you about my first 4th of July? I said, no. So the soldiers liberated them on April the 14th, but they stayed until, September. Yeah, until the end of September. So during that time, of course, the 4th of July was in there. And mom says that she remembers, now understand, she couldn't understand a word of what was being said, but she was deeply moved by that same uh, feeling Fireworks. of... Huh? Of the fire, just, just the feeling of... Emotion. Yeah, just being real emotional. Tears were running down her face. And she ends it with, if I could ever meet one of the soldiers that liberated my camp, I would be fulfilled. So, of course, the internet had pretty much just come out, but I 
was able to fool around with it and I actually discovered that there was going to be a reunion of the 84th Infantry, which is who uh, rescued them. And uh, there was a, a contact member and I called and the gentleman said to me, I really hate to disappoint you, but the fact is that uh, almost everybody from World War II is pretty much gone. I don't think you're gonna find anyone that you were looking for. And I said, if I send you a letter, will you post it at the reunion? He said, of course, and he did. A couple of weeks later on a Sunday morning, the phone rings and um, the gentleman says, hi, my name is Max Lieber. You do not know me, but you wrote this letter. He got no further because I was just speechless. I had to have my husband take the call because I could not believe that I had reached back 65 years to find someone from them, from there. I have a picture up here of Max Lieber who became like family to us. Um, I'm gonna leave these pictures up here if anybody wants to look at it later. Um, so anyway, I found Max Lieber. Now, I was gonna surprise mom with him, but of course I wanted the family around to see this. So my kids came from New York, my brother came from Georgia, my sister came from North Carolina, and we all uh, pretended it was about somebody's birthday. <clears throat> so now, um, my husband says to me the day before, he says, you know, Rachel, you think it's really the right thing to surprise a woman in her 80s with nine heart stents? <laughs> yeah, maybe not. So we went over to mom's and my kids were there, my two grandchildren. My grandchildren were two and three. Mom has a passion for babies. And I couldn't distract her, I wanted to tell her. And I'm like, Ma, I have to tell you something. Oh, yeah, yeah, look how cute they are. No, no, Mom, I really have to speak to you. Okay, wait, wait, just wait a minute. <laughs> I couldn't get her attention. Finally, I yelled, Mom, I have to tell you something. She says, what? I said, you know that soldier you wanted to meet? She looks at me with this blank face and says, yeah. I said, he's coming tomorrow. <laughs> Now, she is a Jewish mother, because the first words out of her mouth were, there's no food in the house, we have to go shopping. <laughs> anyway, so Max Lieber could not wait to He lived in New Mexico. He couldn't wait to come to Arizona to meet, and it was a reunion that is purely indescribable. Max became a member of the family. We would go to New Mexico to to visit him, he would come to Arizona to visit us on a regular basis. And he loved to invite all his friends when we went to New Mexico. So one day, we're sitting in the living room, and Max looks at mom and says, <laughs> Esther, do you like honey? <laughs> and she says, Not anymore. <laughs> And he says, I know why, you're the honey girl. Yeah, so, yeah, really. We have so many small world stories miracles. that it's mind-boggling, miracles. One thing that all survivors have in common are miracles, because yes. they were targeted for murder because mm -hmm. of their religion, and fully two-thirds of the European Jews were murdered. So um, they, they yeah. got pretty close. They, they say that, I, I took a, a, a college class about Hitler specifically, and they said that if instead of dividing his resources between the war machine and the killing of Jews, if he had, if he had only concentrated on the war machine, put all, all everything into that, we would all be speaking German today. Yeah. So um, it's that's a fact, and it's a har hard one to swallow. Yes, yes. So now you've been liberated. I was liberated. It's wonderful. We were there until September, and being 
that my birth certificate is Czechoslovakian, and the Czechoslovakians decided to take their Jewish people home first. So I was among the first ones. They took me on a ship to Prague, and from Prague, they took me on a train towards Budapest, the capital of Hungary. But then I had to get off that train, get another train to go to my hometown, where I get off the train, and the only cousin that survived of a family of 35 people got liberated first, so he came to the train station every day to see who's coming home. And I got off the train. He was very happy to see me, but he says, Esther, no use for you to go home. Nobody survived. The Russians even took over your house, so you have nowhere to go. But we have an uncle in Israel, Palestine then, and I have a very good friend who's taking orphans towards Palestine, children from the camps between ages of 12 and 18. I was 17. He introduced me, and his, this friend of his says, well, where are you from? And when I tell him the name of the town, he says, oh, I had a great uncle there. I says, who was your great uncle? And when he told me the name, I was in awe of him right away because he was the saintest rabbi in my hometown. Even the Christian woman respected him when they saw him coming, they pulled on one side because such a religious rabbi will not go through two women. So they respected him so much that they pulled aside. So I thought to myself, if my parents would know whom I'm befriending, how happy they would be. And we started going on the way. He was 23 years old. He took upon himself 60 orphans from the camps between ages of 12 and 18. I was 17. He took me along. Before we knew it, first we became very good friends, and before we knew it, we fell in love. And by the time we got to Israel, two weeks later, Rachel was born. <laughs> we got, <laughs> we got, we got, um, yeah. Thank you. You know, we were wondering so long, Till we decided, I don't know how long it's going to take for us to get to Palestine. So we got married. Here, Mom. Yeah. In a displaced person's camp. This is my wedding gown. Yeah. The, the United Nations took care of us and the American soldiers. So they gave us jackets to wear. And of course, I was wearing jeans. A bride shouldn't wear jeans. So they gave us a blanket. And the girls in the organization sewed me a skirt. And the boys in the organization sold the rations of cigarettes for a month to buy me a piece of white material. After all, a bride should wear something white. So this is my wedding picture. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So anyways, we 
sad when, when they realized that uh, after three months I got pregnant. Oh, so, wait, 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 wait. What? We're not going past that story. No? No. Mm -mm. Sure? I'm positive. <laughs> It's too there good to keep. There might be any youngsters, Dad. <laughs> they, they'll be fine, ma. <laughs> it's still, it's not X-rated. It's just cute. Anyway, okay, okay. She's my boss. Yeah. So after three months that we were married in this displaced persons camp, a woman next door got a bicycle. So I asked her to loan it to me. I wanted to show off my new husband that I know how to ride a bicycle. I get on the bicycle and I holler, Joe, Joe. As I'm hollering, I fell down. I broke my knees. So they took me to the infirmary and I threw up. And the woman, you know, the nurses, spoke only German, and they tell me in German, are you pregnant, are you pregnant? I did not understand. So they took me upstairs, there was a Hungarian doctor, and he tells me, you know you're pregnant? I says, how? Why? <laughs> so he looks at my finger, the United Nations gave me a very, very thin wedding band, and he looks at my finger, and he says, well, you're married, right? I says, yes, so? He says, what do you think you were doing? I says, I thought I was having fun. I had, <laughs> you know, I, I had no idea, because in Europe, you didn't know the facts of life, until when you got married, the day you got married, your mom took you to her bedroom and told you the facts of life. But I'm sorry to say I had no mom then. So I didn't know anything. But I couldn't deprive you of that story. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, when, when the organization realized that I'm pregnant, they made sure they gonna, they didn't want the baby to be born in Germany. So they make, made every effort to send us to France. From there, we took a ship towards Palestine. We were traveling for days and days because the ships started breaking up and they had to fix it. But finally we got to Palestine. We already saw the port of Haifa. We were singing the Hebrew national... Uh, Hatikva. Hatikva. And as we are singing, the British chorus took us off by force from the ship, took us into another ship, and took us back to Cyprus. Well, by force. By force. Right. They threw tear gas into the ship and took us off by force. And we wound up in Cyprus. And we were there for six months. It was a little bit better food, not a lot better. They still had rations, but being I wasn't 18 yet and pregnant, I got a double ration, but we were three couples in one tent, so I shared it with them. And so, finally, finally after six months, the British decided to take 50 people back to Israel. Finally we got our dream. And while we were in Cyprus, I don't know if anybody saw the movie Exodus, Paul, Paul Newman 
played my husband. He was taking children in the garbage cans to transport them to the Haganah, which he knew where it was, and left them there. Instead of garbage, he took children, saved them. And so that went on for six months, till we finally, finally got to Israel. And as I say two weeks later, Rachel was born, which I feel very, very blessed with my daughter. She is a very, very big help to me in everything, including the, my documentary. So, anyways, we were in Israel for six years. In the meantime, when the war broke out in 1948, when Israel became an independent state, uh, my husband and three of his brothers went into the army next day. And one of his brothers died. My father-in-law, who was already in Toledo, Ohio, sent us such sad letters how, how sad it is to lose a child which now I understand because I lost two in the last two years. So I know what he meant. And so my husband decided, well, Esther, we have to come to the United States. But we couldn't come straight to the United States. We wound up six months in France and then finally got the Canadian visa. We went to Canada for six years till we finally got the United States visa in 1958. And here we are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I just, I just would like to say one more thing. You see, uh, when Steven Spielberg made that movie, Schindler's List, he sent all the proceeds to Holocaust survivors who wants to make a tape of their life. And my husband and I made a tape. And when the woman from Hollywood finished her story, asked me, Esther, how do you feel about the Germans today? I said, well, I cannot forget the horror they put me through, but I can forgive. Because if I don't forgive, if I hold a grudge, I only hurt myself. This woman from Hollywood hugged me, telling me I was the first Holocaust survivor to answer her question the way I did. But I believe it very strongly, you see. I don't even have a picture of my parents. Nothing, nothing but what they taught me. To be good. If you can't do anything good, don't do anything bad. Love all people regardless of their race or religion. Love everybody. Love God. Think positive and you'll have a happy life. And this is what I'm doing. And I have a very happy life. <laughs> Thank you very much. And after what I <coughs> went through, after what I went through, I live a wonderful life with we my do. daughter. We do. I feel very, very blessed. We go uh, dancing a couple times a week. We do. I said she dances. The good-looking guys walk right past me. 
<laughs> to mom. It's, it's pretty funny, but we do. And then there's uh, mom really likes uh, American Indians casino. <laughs> So the joke is, she gets a very, and when I say small, minute pension from Germany. And she takes it from the Germans and gives it to the Native Americans. <laughs> I wanted to say also that when mom was talking about falling off that bike, I was like, oh man, I came by this naturally. <laughs> yeah. But I, thank you so much for listening. So, thank you very much. Thank you. We're going well, to open the opportunity now for some questions um, to Esther. So, on the screen, there's a phone number. Um, you are welcome to text any questions to that number, um, and we will try to answer as many um, as. As we can. Wow, talk about technology. So, that number, 707 559 8585. You can text your questions um, and we will we'll read it out. Thank you. So, we have a, several questions coming in. So, we'll start with um, When did you tell your own children about your experiences in the war? It took us a long, long, long time, years. We couldn't, we couldn't do it. The children heard us crying in the middle of the night because we had nightmares, both of us. They did not understand. You want to explain? Yeah, um, it, it's really a good question because I was debating whether to bring this into it or not. But when we lived in Canada, I, we got there, I was six. And... Um, Mom had told me to tell the teacher that I couldn't come into school the next day because it was Yom Kippur. So I did, and I told the teacher. And that's when the school that was all Christian except me learned that I was Jewish. And uh, these children, remember we started with me saying about children being a clean slate. Well, these children, six years old, were taught that I had uh, killed Christ. They were taught that I had devil's horns under my hair, that I drank the blood of Christian babies. But it was not something that I could discuss with my parents. These kids would wait every day after school to beat me because of this horrible thing I had done. But I couldn't tell my parents because even though I didn't know what was going on in their lives, I knew that it had something to do with Judaism. Every, but every time there was a knock on the door and they, and they would huddle or, or uh, fear of uniforms, fear of dogs, um, so many things that I kind of knew instinctively it was connected to being Jewish but I couldn't bring myself to add to their pain by telling them what was going on with me. And I also came to believe that there must be something really, really wrong with being Jewish because we were being punished. My parents had been punished in some way and I was being punished because I probably deserved it. That's a terrible thing for a six-year-old to do. To sleep with. I we have some really great questions coming in, so I want to try to get as, through as sure. many as we can. Um, so first of all, this is not a question, but I want to share that somebody sent in, um, that her, her beloved father was part of the infantry that liberated um, where you were. Unfortunately, he passed away 45 years ago, um, but it would be beautiful if at the end she He could was meet part you. of the 84th? Yes. Oh yes. my goodness. Yes. Um, so there's several questions coming in if you had gone ever gone back to your hometown or back to the concentration camp? No, never, never. If they didn't want me there, I didn't want to go back. The only place, the only place that I would love, love to go back at least one more time is Israel. This is my dream. To go back to Israel at least one more time. That is my 
That is my dream, that is my hope. But at um, 95, I don't know. <laughs> we have some, we have um, a few questions about your husband. Was he also a survivor yes. of the war? He was. Yes. But he, you see, he came out of the camps bitter because he had a very, very rough childhood. Not like I had loving parents. I was a very happy child. But my husband, <coughs> his mom died when he was four years old. He had a little brother two years old. And my father-in-law didn't know what to do. He went to a matchmaker, and the matchmaker brought him a woman, and he says to her, well, I have two children. And the woman says, I love, love children. Soon as they got married, she says, I can only take care of one. The older one has to go. So my husband was thrown from aunts to uncles, whoever wanted to take him in. So he had a miserable childhood. He didn't know about love until he met me. So, it, the concentration camps affected him entirely differently. He was in slave labor, and he built roads for the army, and uh, he was severely tortured. And when he was liberated, he uh, was about 60 pounds, and he had typhoid fever. Yes. And he was, and at liberation, he found yeah. some of his family, you said, his he, father uh, and his brothers. He was yeah, he did. Reunited. Yeah. He was did living. you have any siblings? I'm not. Uh, do I? No, no Esther, Mom, you, do Mom you was an only child. only child. However, her father had been married previously, and uh, two boys. older boys... She thought were their cousins, but they were her half brothers. Uh -huh. She came to Van. She was brought up as an only. Did child. they survive as well? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What happened to your friend Helen? To, oh Helen. Helen. She never saw Helen um, after, after she had yeah. left. However, but, however, uh, yeah. Ilunka, the one that cut in line in front of her for the yeah. soup. Go ahead. So we came to Canada. By then I already had three children. I was walking on the streets. All of a sudden I see a woman with two children running and she's holding herself and I holler, Ilunko, where are you running? She says, you mean you're not going to beat me up? I says, why should I? You were hungry. I was hungry, but now we have a belly full, and we became the best of friends. And then there's Branya. Yeah. The Branya was the, the couple that, that saved her life. Yeah. We were walking on Coney Island Avenue Brooklyn. with my husband one day, and as we're walking, we see a new bakery. And my husband says, Esther, let's go in see if we can afford something good. So we go in, and I holler, Branya. And my husband hollers, Branya, because he was at his uncle, where his uncle lived, that he was with him, is where Branya was born. And they were good friends in the same town. And so it was a wonderful reunion. I had a chance to thank her for saving my life. So, you um, know. so Esther, here's another question. It says, we brought our 12-year-old daughter tonight. What would you like for her to take forward into her life and her community? Well, what I would like to know from the 12-year-old is why she thinks we are here. Why is this important? is what I would like to know. So I'll ask her, I'll answer her question first. Uh, we would like to see her be confident in the knowledge that she heard, 
She actually heard a first-hand account of what happened during Nazi Germany. So if anybody says to her, it never happened, she can say, oh, I know it happened. Yes. But I would like to know, I would like to know from one of the kids or any of the kids why they think it's important that we are here. Yes. You can yes. text in your answer. Um, Esther, did you ever eat honey again after that day you got sick? I'm sorry. Did you ever eat honey again after <laughs> that day? No, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Not fond of honey. No, no. Or honey. bananas. Or bananas. When they, we were oh, in Cyprus, <laughs> yeah, when we were in Cyprus, she would see, and, and she was pregnant, she would see guys go by with these trees of bananas, you know, over their shoulder, and she thought they looked so amazing that when my father met his brothers in Israel, they were dying to meet his wife, and he said, well, don't come over without bananas. So they brought a bunch of bananas. She took one bite, violently ill, and has never had another banana in her life. I threw up all over the hotel. <laughs> Esther, at what point never, in your life? Never, never. Can't even smell a banana. <laughs> at finish. what point in your life did you decide to forgive the Germans for what they did? I don't think it was ever a decision for her. No, I, I just... You see, I feel, I feel the everything is okay with the world for me. I can't even explain the feeling. You know what? If she hadn't gone through the horrific experiences yeah. that she went through, she wouldn't be here to teach, would she? Yeah. You see, I can I just tell you one more thing. You see, uh, we speak all over, and we have a. Uh, in Prescott, Arizona, at the Yavapai College. We teach. We teach. And um, when I finish my story at the college, a man comes to me, thanking me, and he says, you know, I didn't speak to my brother for 20 years because he did something I didn't like. But if you can forgive the Germans, I'm gonna go home, call my brother, tell him I forgive him. That made me feel so good. I did something good. And I believe in that. I believe in being good, think positive, love God, so that brings Life us... Life is beautiful. Beautiful. That connects to our, our... The next question is, how did you and others in the camp keep your connection to God, and how were you able to keep hope? Wait, everybody... You've told me 99% of the women yes. in Auschwitz... Oh, yeah. We were sometimes walking in Auschwitz on the street. Every woman, 99% of the women said there is no God. How can he look down at this horror and do nothing? I had never even entered my mind. Never even entered my mind. You see? Your faith. I believe. Yeah, your faith yeah. Is, yes. is what got yeah. you here. You yes. know, when I was in Auschwitz and it came Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and I was still very, very religious then, I, you know. So the Germans decided to give us that little piece of bread that they gave us every day, that at night when the, when the stars are out already, thinking if somebody is religious, they're not going to eat it. And sure enough, I didn't eat it. I put it under my pillow. pillow. My pillow. My <laughs> head. Who had a pillow? Yeah. <laughs> I put it under my head, thinking next day I'm going to have two pieces of bread. 
It never happened. Somebody took it away from me in the middle of the night. I, you know, if I think about it, I would have been very angry, but I wasn't. I don't know. I just don't know how to be angry or how to... Uh. Yeah, another story she tells is she'd be crying for her mother, and yeah. one of the women in the camp says, well, you know, why are you crying? And she tells him, and the woman says, I know where your mother is. Yeah. And if you give me bread, I will give it to her. For two weeks, for two weeks I didn't have a piece of bread at all, because I thought I'm giving it to my mom. And then? Yeah. And then and what? And then she beat, the Nazi saw that, and she beat her up mercilessly. And she hollers at me. Don't you know where your mom is? And points to the gas chambers. Now that didn't make me very happy. Not because of the bread, because she's telling me, but I still didn't believe it in my heart. I still didn't believe it. So the next question is actually connected to this. You were never able to find a photo of your parents. Was it hard to hold their memory of their face in your mind. What keeps the memory of your parents' faces in yeah. your mind? Yeah. I still see them. I still see them. You know, in, in European tradition, when your child gets married, you go to uh, your parents' grave and you invite them. And when I got married, mom was heartbroken because there was no grave. Yeah. Um, Esther, when did your husband pass away? How long since daddy's gone? 19 years. 19 years. Wow. 19 years. Yes. We were married for 58 wonderful years. Yeah. Thank you. Very much. So, Esther, I want to share with you, Rachel, you put out the question of why are, why are you here mm -hmm. to the 12, the 15, mm -hmm. the 16-year-old. Yeah. So we have some answers, and Great. I want to read them to you. Wonderful. Yes. Uh, so one of the 11 and a half year olds answers your question is why is it important that she is here? I believe it's important to know that people have lived through far harder times, that there is reason out there to feel truly helpless, but that if they can continue on with faith and love in their hearts, we can too. Aww. Um, this, is, this is from the girl who had the original question of what yeah. would you tell. Yeah. Um, she says, I think it's important to be here to hear Esther speak about what happened to her and how she survived and found love and happiness and an amazing life afterwards. And yes, I agree that if anyone tells me Nazi Germany didn't happen, all the people of my generation should be able to say, yes, it did. And I was in a room with a survivor, and I listened to her talk about what happened to her. That's great. Um, there's a few more. One second. Thank you, Betty. I'm 15, and I'm here right now, and I think it's important for you guys to share this knowledge so a Holocaust won't happen again. Yes. Amen. 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 It's important because without knowledge of the past, we are doomed to re repeat the mistakes mm -hmm. of the past. Absolutely. You know, just one more thing. You know, a Holocaust survivor, when I see how people care, I feel like a burden is off my shoulder. I have less and less nightmares then I see how people care. I thank you so very much for coming and listening to me. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. Esther, can we do two more questions? Two more questions. Two more. Okay. Um, two more? Two more questions, Ma. Yes. Two more. Um, there's a request to explain what type of work were the women and you forced to do in the labor camp? Yes. What, were, what did you do in the labor camp? Oh, I was working in an ammunition factory that I had to hand, uh, solder the handles to the mines that they throw in the ocean to explode. 
And this is why I don't have fingerprints, because many times I was so exhausted. I worked 12 hours a day, and every two weeks the shift changed, so I worked 24 hours. I was so exhausted that I soldered my fingers to the mines. So I don't have any fingerprints. But thank God the United States was nice enough to send, to give me a, an American visa. Even though I could have been a criminal, I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> they must not have checked far back enough. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Esther, we have one more message. I believe that this is important because if you are brave enough to talk about this, my generation could be brave enough to speak up about what we think is wrong. Thank you. I'm almost 12 years old, and I think it's important that you're willing to pass on the history, and your story is beautiful. Oh, my. That's from an 11-year-old. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for thank everything. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. That is just beautiful. Yeah. <coughs> I know you said thank you for listening, but I just want to say thank you for talking about this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much.